I just want to first off say um, how I'm really pleased that my organisation put themselves out there to actually ask these hard questions. I'm really proud to be part of Ballarat Health Services and I'm really excited about the future, um, which is probably not how I've felt in the past as a, being part of the palliative care team, to be honest. At this point, I would like to acknowledge um, Denise Fitzpatrick and also um, Dr. Wendy Penny from Fed Uni. So just in terms of methodology, uh, we did invite the next of kin whose loved ones had died on our acute wards, and this was around expected deaths between the 1st of January and the 30th of uh, September in 2013. We did use a qualitative interpretive design um, and we collected the data via semi-structured, open-ended individual questions. Uh, next slide, please. The interviews were recorded and transcribed and the thematic analysis was undertaken by two researchers independently. <coughs> and the end result was that we had 13 participants share their very private thoughts and you could imagine that this was quite distressing for some of these families. And uh, we discovered that there was five key themes that emerged from the data. So um, we've seen this slide from Denise and I'll use uh, examples from the uh, family members to demonstrate how we came up with these key themes. So the first, first one I want to talk about is preparation for death. Um, this woman, I was really excited to meet this woman because I'd had some pretty awful interviews and I was excited that we had actually come to a rational decision for her father. And I'll leave you to read those quotes. Um, she then went on to say that she was really surprised that no one had actually tried to talk him out of it. So I was a little bit depressed then because I was thinking, oh, <laughs> is this is what the public think about um, people talking about death and dying. Um, this I would, have ex I would explain as being a, an example of a good death. Um, her and her brothers sat around the room. Um, her dad told stories of growing up in Ballarat. They were expecting him to die. And, um, and that's how they spent their time waiting for death to occur. This young woman will be embedded in my mind for the rest of my life. She was the next of kin of her grandfather. Um, her mother was not in the picture. Uh, she came in and out at the last days of life. Um, but for some reason, our organisation thought that the mother was the next of kin. So they had conversations with her mother and that didn't transpire to Cal. And so Cal felt like she was really cheated of opportunity to talk to our healthcare professionals. She was desperate to take him home to die and she actually prompted three times to take him home to die and three times we ignored her. Um, she was so distraught by her experience at our organisation that she couldn't come through the doors. I actually had to go and meet her off site. Um, and she was really apologetic, but she saw it as an opportunity to uh, give us feedback about her experience. So she was pretty adamant about doing it. And she lived at Waterloo, which is a small community town outside of Ballarat. Um, she's got a large property there and, and her grandfather was pretty adamant that that's where he wanted to die. And of course he didn't. Um, so this woman, uh, her husband had an event at home in a regional area and um, they transported him via ambulance to our ED department. She uh, got there before the ambulance did and so she waited and she waited and she waited and she explains how she thought that he had actually died and that no one wanted to come and talk to her about it and then so she finally took up enough courage to go up to the window and say what's happening with my husband and oh he, he's gone off to theatre or she was a bit unsure about where he'd gone and she said um, so he's not he hasn't died and we said, no, no, of course he hasn't died. After that point, he did actually die in our hospital and, and it was quite a positive experience for them. He died in our ICU unit and she went on to say that they had lots of family conferences and, and she was really aware of what was going on with him and they decided to turn the machines off and all that sort of stuff. So she felt quite positive about his death, but the start of her experience with us was not that great. 
Um, this woman was really critical of the care that her husband had received with us. Um, she really wanted to be part of the care. She wanted to participate. She wanted, she'd been caring for him at home. And then of course, when she came into an acute ward, all hands off. So she was a bit disappointed that um, she was told that he was in pain and that she could have probably done something about it before she had enough nerve really to ask the nurse. Unfortunately, this woman went down to have a cup of coffee and when she come back, the curtains around his bed were pulled and when she went in, he was dead. And she wasn't sure whether someone had known he was dead and pulled the curtains. Um, that's what she actually thinks happened. Um, but she's disappointed that no one met her at the door and said, he's actually passed away while you've been down having a coffee. So she's quite traumatised by that experience. Um, this woman, um, she met with me, with her sister and her brother. Their interview went for over two hours. Um, they really wanted to make a complaint and were very unsure of how to do that in our organisation. And then our letter arrived and invited them to participate in the research. And so they saw it as an opportunity. Um, I think for them, some of them, uh, one of the sisters had had um, nursing experience and so she was particularly critical of our care. Um, the brother hardly said anything, although he did cry basically through the two hours of the interview. Next. Um, this woman was devastated about how her mother had finished her life um, in this world. She believes that the way her mother was treated was not how her mother deserved to spend the last days of her life. And I think the last sentence for me is just heartbreaking that we have vulnerable people in our community and that's what they think. Um, this is um, part of the interview that I did with the initial woman who started the whole process for Ballarat Health Services. Um, she did then go on to say that um, she had been concerned that if the NFR had been successful, it was her understanding that her husband would have been in a vegetative state and that she was quite um, distressed about how she would explain that to her children and that that would have been the last memories of her, um, for her children of their father. And so I think that was part of the reason why she um, drove, really, she has driven um, the change in practice at Ballarat Health Services. I think follow-up death is really interesting. Um, for some wards, we don't really think about following up with the family. Um, like Denise said, some of the families have been with us for months and months through treatment options. Um, there was some families that talked about how they were called by their first name and how they felt like they had a relationship with the tea and coffee lady and all those sorts of things. Um, so I think sometimes they can be very disappointed that once their loved one dies, that's it, they don't hear from us. And, and it's probably an area that we really need to think about more about and, you know, how we resource that. Um, and then I think the other thing is if we think, if we say we're going to do something, we should do it. And Fran um, was, you know, she had put in a complaint um, because I think if we'd rang her up the next day just to say, I'm checking in on you, how are you going, have you got family with you? We could have just subdued her anxiety, but instead we actually escalated by not following through with what we said we were going to do. Um, Ina was a very interesting woman. She lived um, in a small regional area um, and I met her at her house. <coughs> I felt like she was at a real risk when I met her and um, she talked about hating being alone and how she had never been separated from her husband and for some partners this is the way it is. Um, so at one stage she said, I just want to end everything. And I thought, okay. And I said, so are you having suicidal thoughts? And she said, yes. And so I stayed with her that day. We got her in to um, see her GP. Um, I linked her back into community health 
and um, I checked on her a couple of months later and she's doing okay. Um, Cal actually did have a breakdown. This is the young lady who's next of kin, was, she was the next of kin for her grandfather. Um, and so she says, you know, it was a pretty hard, long road. And I'm not sure that we could have stopped that from happening, but we certainly did contrib contribute to it. So just to move through quickly, <coughs> the basic um, emphasis around communication was that they want more communication. I don't think we can communicate too much with people, to be honest. And if we did, they'd tell us, but they're less likely to tell us if we're not communicating with them at all. Thanks. Um, Fran was particularly anxious because she felt like there was lots of signs and symptoms that her husband was dying and we didn't call her. She actually flew back from Sydney because he'd rang her and he sounded scared was what she said. Um, and um, she said that she had about 15 minutes with him and then he died. Next please. Um, <coughs> I think there's a lot of inferred conversations. So I think, you know, the Ali's conversation around is that, you know, he was being moved into a single room and we know that, we know what that means. And I think no one should be having inferred conversations. They should be quite outright and, um, and that way family are informed. No one should be left guessing is probably the message I got from them. Thank you. So when you think about it, this is all around um, communication. All their recommendations there are around communication. Um, and uh, we've used some of these um, quotes throughout the framework because I think we can't underestimate how powerful our patients' experiences can be. Again, around communication and this searching for someone to talk to, searching for someone that might know what's actually going on. Um, thank you. <clears throat> and I wonder the point of having a, um, like a navigator for people because Jerry was saying she just didn't know who to go to, you know, so it was always someone different or she got not fobbed off. She didn't use those words, but that she was asked to go and see so-and-so or, you know, that nurse has got dad today or that nurse has got mum. So there was lots of um, inference, I think. And I love Cal's final quote, which is that it's not about losing control, not being able to help him. And I know that's the process of letting go, but the system doesn't help either. And we should be absolutely helping, absolutely. So where to from here? Um, like Denise said, we're at the point where the framework is coming up. Um, it's in draft. Um, we're very excited. Um, we probably could have pulled the raft together in about a couple of months, but what we've actually done is engaged our community, engaged our healthcare professionals. Everyone knows what's going on. Um, I love it when people argue, us about, argue with us about it because it means they're engaged. You know, that's exciting. Um, I think we need to redo the interviews and the plan is to do them again in October, so that would be two years post. And it'll be interesting to see if we get the same themes. And, in the meantime, we will continue to spread the word that, you know, good end of life care is everybody's business. It's not about palliative care specialists. Thank you.